an electrical connector, and five small trunnion and keel pin covers. They brought these items over in bags that they prepped inside, pulling them out two or three items at a time to save trips. Scott will also remove four pins, one from each of the radial berthing mechanisms, and he'll release the Zenith most berthing pedal launch restraints. They'll also remove 16 caps from under the large MLI covers that you see flashing on the right. When Dan gets done on the truss, uh, Scott will stop work temporarily on this outfitting, and then he and Dan will detach the grapple fixture that they'd installed on Harmony for its ride to space station. It's been held on by Tether since EVA 1. Together they move it down to the nadir side of node 2, where you can see that flashing ring. They'll install four fasteners to hold it in place, and then attach two connectors that were previously loosened in the payload bay. This later allows the SSRMS to be based on this grapple fixture for future robotics operations. At the end of the EVA, they both take their empty bags back to the airlock. Scott will go into the airlock first, followed by Dan. So at the end of this EVA, P6 is in transit, and Dan's next EVA will be in the stage with Peggy a few days after shuttle undocking. After EVA 2, the crew works on relocating P6 down to the port end of the truss, just shy of berthing it uh, to P5. The third spacewalk is performed on flight day 8 by Scott and Wheels, and it's expected to be a seven-hour EVA. Let's roll the video for EVA 3. Again, we'll start by zooming in on the airlock quest. This time, Wheels will egress first, followed by Scott, which spreads the, spreads the experience of operating the hatch amongst the crew. After they come out of the hatch, they have a long way to travel to get down to P5 so they can assist with P6 installation. You can see P6 flashing all the way down the truss on the right. We'll fly the virtual reality simulator down there. And when we get there, you'll see that P6 is, is positioned just off of P5. In flight, it will be 130 centimeters out and two meters forward. Due to the required precision to install the truss and the need to monitor the robotic clearances, the EVA crew is required for berthing cues to help the robotic operators with the fine details. As we fly up, you'll see Scott in the foreground at the Nader forward corner, and Wheels is in the aft zenith. The crew is going to flash here for a second. They'll give verbal, verbal guidance for berthing, and then Wheels will close the capture claw. After this, they'll go around to each corner and install the RTAS bolts in a specific sequence ending with a sequence using a torque wrench. And then they'll release the preload on the capture latch so that the bolts carry the primary load for the life of space station. The next major objective will be to apply power to P6 so it can be activated and its arrays can be redeployed. This is done with four umbilicals. So Scott begins mating the connectors from P5 to P6. As we fly around here, you'll be able to see the area they're working in that's going to be flashing. Scott's in a foot restraint due to the cable stiffness and the geometry in the area. Here's some video from the Neutral Buoyancy Laboratory, so you can see the general work site. Wheels will come over at the end of the procedure to help Scott as required. Next, they'll go to the very tip of the newly installed truss element and take the shrouds off of the sequential shunt units. These are the same shrouds that were installed on EVA-1. They put these in a bag to bring inside, and then Wheels heads back to um, the lab to start working on the MBSU task. Scott stays behind and releases the cinches on the photovoltaic radiator so that it can be redeployed as part of the P6 activation steps. Once the cinches are released, the radiator will be deployed with a command from the ground. The radiator is deployed during a day pass, so it can be watched for any unusual movement or problems. Scott might or might not be in the area depending on his timing. Next, Scott heads back to the starboard truss. Between EVAs 2 and 3, the ground sent commands to fire the cinches on the S1 outboard radiators, and these radiators should be deployed by this EVA, although it isn't shown that way in this video. Now that the radiator cinches have fired, Scott reconfigures the squib firing unit back to the way we found it by swapping a connector and cap. Then Scott will have some free time where he can perform some small get-aheads like bag moves and strap installations. 
And now back to what Wills has been doing since he last left Scott on P5. He sets up the shuttle robotic arm with an adapter and a foot restraint. And he gets onto that foot restraint over on the Nader lab. He might have to direct George and Stephanie, the arm drivers, with cues for moving the arm. Here you can see him coming into the upper part of the screen. They then fly wheels over to the shuttle payload bay on the starboard side to pick up the critical spare box called the main bus switching unit, MBSU. He drives one bolt to release it and then takes it back to space station via the shuttle arm. Scott's waiting for wheels to arrive so they can both install it on external stowage platform two. Wheels needs Scott's help because the arm can't quite reach for wheels to install it by himself. Here you can get a feel for the size of the box, which weighs 525 pounds. After that, wheels will take the foot restraint off of the shuttle arm and they'll both come inside. Scott going into the airlock first. Right around this time, the first solar array will be redeploying on P6, so the day is still pretty busy for the IVA crew after the EVA. After EVA 3, the array should be deployed that same day, so the crew can get ready for their next EVA two days later. As you've heard, we might insert a spacewalk after